Hi, my name is Lee Stranahan, and welcome to Toaster Essentials Lighting and Camera Techniques. In this tape, we're going to be showing you all of the essentials for both lighting and using the camera. In lighting, we're going to be talking about such things as using lens flares, effective use of the three different types of lights that you have, and creating shadows. In camera work, we're going to be showing you how to adjust zoom. We're going to be showing you different camera moves that you can use, and also talking about such features as motion blur and depth of field. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get started right away. Now the animation you're looking at right now, we're going to run this a couple of times, and the only thing that's changing in this animation are things that have to do with lighting. The camera and the object are staying right in the same place, but you can see in there that by changing light levels and by moving lights and some other special effects things, and we can create a lot of really nice effects. So let's start talking about lights, and let's start at the very beginning. Let's start with the absolute basics. And what I'm going to do is I will load up from the furniture drawer a couple of objects that are in there. We'll load up the desk, and we will load up a uh, office chair, and maybe the movie chair as well. And here is our objects. Let's just go to our top view and sort of arrange these. One thing I can do by going to the top view is arrange these without affecting them in the y-axis. Move it into position, keyframe it. Oops. Next object, move that into position. Rotate it on heading a little bit, keyframe it. Again, as soon as we move the object where we want it, we start to keyframe it. And now let's go to our camera view. And let's just back our camera off a little bit and move it up. You can see by being in the top view there, again, it let me move things around without adjusting them so they're still on this sort of invisible ground plane. And let's just render this scene. We'll go to low resolution. So we'll hit F9 to render here. And let's talk about the attributes of lights. Now, the first attribute of any light that we want to talk about is intensity. Intensity means how bright is the light. And there is always a light in every scene that you have in Lightwave. You cannot have no lights. So the default light that comes in is 100% intensity. And this is the way this scene looks with a 100% intensity light. Let's hit Escape. All right, let's go to light, and let's adjust our intensity. Our light intensity is shown right here, and currently it's 100%. Let's adjust this to something radical like 0%. And we just type in 0, hit Enter. Now our light intensity is 0%. Hit Continue, and we'll hit F9 to render it. Now, our one light that's in the scene is now 0% intensity, so we should see nothing, total blackness, correct? Maybe not. Take a look. We're still seeing something. And the reason for that is because Lightwave has what's called ambient light. Ambient light intensity is light that affects the entire scene, irregardless of where any other lights are. But ambient intensity controls is how dark an image can get, how dark the darkest parts of an image can get. So in other words, if you have an ambient intensity of 25, which is the default setting, your things can only get so dark. Even if no light is hitting part of an object, it can't be completely dark. And that's what you're seeing right here. Now, if we took ambient intensity, again, from light panel, ambient intensity, down to zero, well, this is going to render as total black nothingness. And I find the ambient intensity of 25 that's set there is pretty unrealistic. If you want to do reality, I would set ambient intensity down to about 5 10% maybe. Now, on the other hand, for your average flying logo scene, 25% is fine. You don't want the logo to look too dark. A dark, brooding logo doesn't sell many products, even though it might be a little more dramatic. But on the other hand, if you want realism, or if you're doing, for instance, night, you're doing a nighttime logo flyby down a deserted street or something like that, what you'd want then is a very low ambient intensity. This is a zero ambient, zero light intensity scene. That's the way they all look. No light intensity, total darkness. OK, so let's adjust those things up. And let's set our ambient intensity to about 10% and our light intensity to 100%. And let's talk about the next attribute of lights here, which is color. Lights can be any color you want. You have 16 million color cho choices for any light. And you choose that by clicking on light color. And that brings up these red, green, and blue sliders. And let me set a purple color by dropping our green down and leaving red and blue up. And let's hit F9 to render this out. 
And this will give us a sort of purple hue. Our one main light is purplish. And that kind of gives the whole scene a purplish tint. Now you can also set color for ambient light. You can also set the ambient color. And to do that, you just go where it says ambient color, click on that, and adjust the sliders the way you want. What this can be very, very handy for is setting something, like let's say you have a sunset, and you want just a sort of, just a real light orange color on the entire scene, and you want it everywhere, you might set a little bit of orange, for instance, in the ambient intensity. That can be very handy. Also, you might want to set the color of lights to any color you want if you wanted to do colored lights. Now, usually, if your only light in the scene is colored, your scene's going to look a little weird, as this one does. Usually, you'll want at least one white light in the scene. So let me just set our light here back, color back to normal. OK, now let's talk about light type. We've talked about intensity, and we've talked about color. There's three types of lights. And any light in a scene in Lightwave can be either a distant point or spotlight. And there's a big difference here between distant point and spotlights, and it's very, very important to understand. Because the way you position these lights, the way you set up your lights in the scene, is dependent on whether you're using a distant point or spot. Now, let's talk about distant first, because that's the default light. When you start up a scene for the first time, the light defaults as a distant light. You choose that from right here. Let's take a look at, let's choose the light as our current edit item. And you'll see it's not normally visible until we click on edit light. So there it is. And you'll see the way this looks. It looks like a regular sort of light can. You can see here's barn doors. And they show which way the light is facing. Right now, for instance, the light is facing away from me. For, in other words, forward and off to the right. Now I've got it facing forwards up and to the left. Now, the distant light, the only thing that's important about it is which way the light is facing. The position of the light doesn't make any difference. And you can see that in this scene. The light is under the table. It's actually under the table and nowhere near the chairs. But if I turn it down and to the left here, still facing away from me, create a keyframe and re-render, what's going to happen is you're going to see the entire scene becomes lit with the light coming up and from the right aiming forwards, just like that. If we change the way the light's aiming, let's turn it over here, create a keyframe to save it, and hit F9. You're going to see it changes the lighting. And again, you might try playing around with this. If you want to, take the time and render the scene a few ways, adjusting the light as you want. So you can see the light is now aiming the other way. By just adjusting the angle light, the rotation, it's changed. So the important thing about distant light is the only thing that affects the way the light looks, the actual way the light's facing, is the direction of the light, in other words, the rotation. You can move it anywhere you want, doesn't change anything. Now, let's contrast that with the next type of light, which is a point light. Point light is just the opposite of a distant light. The only thing that makes any difference with a point light is where the light is. So let's change this light to a point light, go to our lights panel, Click on point instead of distant. And you'll see the light image, the actual way it looks, changes here. Now, the way a point light works is if our point light is positioned here, and let's take a look at our side view. Right now, it's under the table. OK. I'll just let it be where it is right now. Let's go to our front view, camera view here, and re-render. And you'll see it's like we've got a light bulb under the table there. If we want to put the light up above and back, let's take a look at the way this looks. There we go. It's like a light bulb's under the table. All right, so let's put this point light in a more normal position. So we'll just do a move here. So we'll select the light as our edit item, move. We'll move it up and over. Let's just go to a, a side view here to make sure this is a good position for it. Zoom in a little bit. OK, that's a good position for it. Maybe up a little higher. Remember to keep it in the position. We need to keyframe it. And now, let me just move it down a little bit and keyframe it there. OK, now let's render. And it will render out from the light in that position. Again, rotation doesn't make any difference to the point light, just where it is. Now, one thing that you'll notice is that when the scene renders here, you'll notice that we do not see the light. 
In other words, we're not seeing, it's not like in reality, where if you put a light bulb right there in the scene, in the position that we have it on the interface here, well, when you rendered the scene out, when you took the picture, you'd see a light bulb there. You'd see the effect of the light. And the reason for this is that we only see the effects of lights in light wave. We don't see beams of lights, or you don't see the actual light themselves. Now, we can change it so you can see that light by using the lens flare option. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, while we're on a point light, let's talk about an attribute that we cannot use with a distant light, only with a point light or spotlight, and that is intensity falloff. What intensity falloff does is it lets you decrease the amount of light. In other words, the light will fall off over distance. And it's a percentage here. And let's enter 10%. And let's think about that, what it means for a minute. Now, our light intensity is 100%. If our intensity fall off is 10%, this means 10% per meter. And what that means is right at the light, the light will be an intensity of 100%, where the light is is 100% intensity. Any objects that are right there will be hit 100% intensity. Any objects a meter away from the light will be 10%, because that's the number we entered, less, or 90% intensity. Two meters away, 80%, three meters away, 70%, four meters away, 60, and so on and so on. So in other words, by the time an object is 10 meters from a 100% intensity light, if your fall off is 10%, it will be not affected by the light at all. In other words, the light will have fallen off 100% over that 10 meters. Now, this is important to note that it's not like reality. Reality, light falls off exponentially. It doesn't work like this. And so you might want to sort of adjust your ideas of lighting when you start to work with this. It's not exactly like reality, but it's pretty straightforward. Now, the thing is, we've set the intensity fall off. How can we tell, we'll go to the light view, for instance, how can we tell whether the light's visible? Well, the way you do that is you go to the front, top, or side views. And if I pan out here, if I back off our view by using the comma key, you see this circle shows us the effect of the light, the radius around which the light is effective. Anything inside this circle will be affected by light. Anything outside won't be. So in other words, anything outside this circle, the light's not hitting at all. Anything inside, it's going to be hitting, although, of course, the farther away you get from the center point, the less of the effect of the light that you have. So in this case, we'll definitely be seeing it, but if we change the light intensity fall off, let's change it to 30%. The circle moves up considerably. It gets much smaller. And now the side of the desk here won't really be affected by the light. And if we render, we'll see that. We'll see that uh, the light does fall off, and the far edge of the desk is in darkness. All right, now let's talk about our third type of light, the spotlight. Before we do that, though, let's just quickly review the distant and the point light. In a distant light, you remember, the only thing that affects where the light seems to be coming from is the direction the light is aiming. In other words, the light's rotation is all that matters. Its position is irrelevant. Now, with the point light, it's just the opposite. The only thing that makes any difference is the light's location. Its direction is completely irrelevant. It has no direction acts like a light bulb, so where it's placed is the only thing that's important. Now with a spotlight, both location and direction are crucial. And let's adjust our light and change it to a spotlight here. And you'll see that the image of our light here is actually different. It looks sort of like a distant light, except now we have these beams coming from it. And these beams show how wide the barn doors are open. With a spotlight, you have variable what's called cone angle. And that affects how wide, and again, the sort of virtual barn doors are. In other words, how wide a beam the light casts. Now, when you're looking at a light from this perspective, for instance, the camera perspective, it's very hard to see where it's aiming. I can't tell, for instance, if it's aimed squarely at the chair. And that's why we have this view here, the light view. So let's click on light view, and we'll see what the light's seeing. This puts us in the can, but it's not nearly as warm as it would be if we actually got in the can with the light. And you see, by aiming the light here, we're moving the light around. We're actually seeing where it would hit. Now, this circle here shows us how wide the cone angle is. And let's just adjust our cone angle. We'll go up to lights. 
Let's change our cone angle, for instance, to 50%. And you'll notice that it's much, much wider here. We're seeing more of it. If we adjust our cone angle to 10%, now you see it's aiming a much, much narrower area. And also, this still changes here as well. If we were to go to the camera viewpoint, pick the light, you see how the cone angle here is shown. This is our 10% cone angle. Let's change it back to 30%. And you'll notice how the beams here get wider. So there's two different visual representations of that cone angle. So let's set up our cone angle. We're happy with 30% where it is. Now let's just adjust our light, aim it where we want. And we're not going to be able to get all three of these objects into this beam. So let's move the light back. Now we're getting all three of the objects. And let's keyframe that there. It's our light's new position. And before we go in to render anything, let's just check our intensity fall off here. And I'm glad I did this because I can see that part of the object here is just outside of the circle. It's not going to be lit at all. So what we we'll want to do is we we'll want to go back and adjust our fall off. Let's make it 5%. Obviously, much bigger circle now. And here we are in camera view. And let's just render this out. Let's see how this looks. And again, we're not seeing much of the effect there. It's because we just have these three objects. Now let's try narrowing the beam. Let's make the beam a lot more focused so we can really see it hit on the desk here. And let's just go to our light view again. And let's change our angle, our spotlight angle, to uh, about 12%, 12 degrees. And OK, we can see it's hitting the desk. Let's re-render this. And what we're going to do is, you can see how this renders. Let's take a look at this now. And what we're going to do is we're going to adjust the soft edge angle and make it completely soft. Now, one thing to note on the soft edge angle is you never want this angle to be bigger than your cone angle. If we were to set this to 5 degrees, that would mean the first 5 degrees of this 12 degree spotlight would now be soft edge, and then the middle part would be harder. What we want to do is, I'm going to use 12%, 12 degrees here, the same as our cone angle. And what this is going to do is it's going to make our beam very, very diffuse, very, very soft all the way through. And I find this is pretty realistic. Often you might want the beam to be sort of soft around the edges and then a lot more focused in the middle. To do that, you just set this soft edge angle to something less than your total cone angle, two, three degrees, something like that. So let's just see how this looks. And as this renders down, you'll see just a little bit better. I think it's a little more realistic, too, generally. When we've talked about the three different types of lights, distant, point, and spotlights. We've also talked about intensity and color changes. Now, one thing that we can do that we have not gotten into yet is that we can change some of these values over time. In other words, we can animate them. To do this, we have to understand a very, very important concept, one that comes up quite a bit in Lightwave, and it'll make your work much more complex, much more interesting. That's the concept of envelopes. Now, an envelope is basically just a way of animating values, changing values over time. And it works just the same way as keyframing does. Remember in the tape one, part one of the series, we talked about keyframing, and we talked a lot about, we've done a lot here already, just moving an object to a different position and creating a keyframe to save it in that position. Well, just the same way we can do that with an object's physical position, we can also do that with values. So for instance, let's say we wanted the light to start off sort of dim, barely on, maybe 5% intensity. Then we want, during the course of an animation, for the light to get very bright and then to quickly fade out again. Well, you can do that using envelopes. And all we do is we create keyframes for the different positions. So let's, in fact, do that. Let's set it. Uh, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to adjust my angle. I'm going to adjust the angle of the light. Now, to tell whether something can be enveloped or not, just look for the little button marked E next to the requester. Notice that ambient intensity has got an E to the right of it. Well, this is envelopable.
Light intensity's got an e to the right of it. This is envelopable, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, let's go in and let's change our spotlight cone angle. And what we'll do is we'll create two keyframes for it. We've got one already created, because remember, there's always a keyframe at 0. So there's a keyframe at 0, and its current value is 12. Let's create another keyframe. You see we have the create and key, uh, delete keyframe buttons here. Create, and let's create it at 30. Here's our 0 frame. Here's our 30 frame. And let's adjust the current value of frame 30, that's where we are now, to be, oh, 50%, 50 degrees here. So it's going to start off at 12 degrees, then move to 50 degrees. Let's use the envelope. And let's just take a look at a preview of this. We're going to preview this from the light view. And what we've done is we've made it so it's going to start at 12 degrees, frame 0, then move to 50 degrees at frame 30. And if we make a preview from the light view, we should be able to see that. So we'll start the preview. And it might look like the light's actually moving back, but what we'll do is we'll look at the preview from this angle, then we'll also go and we'll look at it from another angle, and you'll see that there's the effect from the light. Let's make a preview from our perspective view here. Let's just zoom in our perspective a little bit. Pick the light as our current edit item, and let's make another preview here. And watch what's happening. See how this part of the visual representation here is just opening up. So we're seeing those, the angle adjust there. OK, now this is something that we can see. In other words, when we're in a wireframe preview, we can actually see the angle adjust. Not every setting is so visible. And a good example of that would be light intensity. Let's end our playback here. And let's go back to our light panel. And let's adjust the light intensity. Before we do that, though, I want to turn off the spotlight cone angle here, envelope. Let's hit E. This will bring us back into the envelope, this motion graph requester here. And we can get rid of the envelope that we've created just by clicking on Clear Envelope. Or we can use Remove Envelope, and that will get rid of the envelope that we've selected. So either one of these will work. Let's just click Remove Envelope. And you can see the E is no longer lit there. It's now just this value, just 12 degrees. Throughout the entire animation, the value is not changing. So let's try adjusting our light intensity. We'll create a keyframe at 30. Here we are at 0. Our current value intensity is 100%. At frame 30, our current value intensity is still 100%. And rather than click in here and enter a new value, since our mouse function is currently drag, we can use the left mouse button, click on the keyframe that we want, and then drag it wherever we want. And I'm moving the mouse up and down here, and you're seeing what's happening is, you look at the current value, that's changing. Let's bring this to zero, and let's click on Use Envelope. Now, you'll notice it says Envelope there again, so we're cur currently using an envelope, and let's make a preview. And we're watching as the frames tick by, and nothing seems to be happening. And that's because there's no way to see the effects of light intensity unless you actually render a frame. So we can look at a wireframe preview like this all day. We're not going to see the effects. Now, on the other hand, if we were to start, let's render a frame. Let's go to our camera view here. Let's hit F9 to render the frame at 0. So here's where it's 100% intensity. Now let's move through to a frame in the middle somewhere. We're at frame 16, F9 to render. When this renders out, we should see the intensities diminished, and it has. And finally, at frame 30, the intensity is 0, so we shouldn't see much of anything. Again, we're seeing a little bit of other parts of the objects because our ambient intensity is not set to 0. It's around 5 right now. Now, this is the only way to see the effects of changing light intensities to actually render frames. If you were to animate this, you'd see that light intensity change, however. That's the only way to do it. Now, envelopes are something that we're going to be using quite a bit. You're going to see a lot of uses for them. And right now, if you can understand the basics of just creating keyframes and setting values, you're off to a very, very good start. Again, it's the same principles as we used 
for keyframing. You set a keyframe number, position and time, then choose a value for it, and away you go. And we'll be using envelopes a lot in this tape. So if you haven't worked with them before, this is a good chance to take time out now, maybe try adjusting a few envelopes yourself and rendering frames to see the effects of that. Okay. All right, now let's add a light. So far, we only have one light in this scene. Let's add a light to this. And to do that, we just click on Add Light. And you'll notice our current light is now Light 2. And you'll notice we had just one light before, which is named Light. Now with two lights, they're named Light 1 and Light 2. And this is a good place to add, to do a rename light. And by clicking on Rename Light, we can give them more descriptive names than Light 1 or Light 2. So I'm going to change Light 1's name to Main Spotlight. And again, this could be any name you want to possibly give it. You can give it standard lighting names. You can call it Kicker or Main or whatever you want to call it. You can name them Larry or Steve if you want to. Anything that you can use that will help you remember what this light is. The problem is, if you load this scene up a couple weeks from now, and you've got 15 lights in there, and they're named Light 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, well, you're just going to be in deep trouble because you're not going to be able to adjust it and do anything that you needed to do. So I always go in and rename my lights here. And I will also name this second light Flare. And let's click on OK. And you guessed it. Next we're going to talk about lens flares. Now, lens flares are very, very useful. And you have a lot of options with them in LightWave. And they are create extremely realistic effects. What lens flares let you do is make lights that you can see, a visible light. It doesn't create light beams. Currently, there's no way to do that in LightWave. But it does give you the point of light, and you do have a lot of options for it. So let's start by just going back to our spotlight here for a second. And we're just going to turn our main spotlight. I'm just actually going to rename it here, main light. And I'm going to turn it back into a distant light, just to make my life a little bit easier. So now the main light in here, also get rid of the envelope. So clear it, remove it. Now we just have this one main light source that's aiming up, you know, it's aiming down and to the right. And we've got this flare light. And let's pick that light and move that in a, to a visible position here. Now you can make any of the three types of light, distant point or spot, a flare light. Personally, I always do it as a point light. So let's make a point light here. And let's just position it back up here and create a keyframe for it. And we hit render. It's not going to do anything. Just naming a light flare light doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Remember, these are just arbitrary names we're giving it. Really doesn't make any difference. What does make a difference, though, is the settings that you give it. So let's hit escape to get out of here. Go to light and click on lens flare. Just by clicking on lens flare, it will give this light, whichever one you currently have chosen, in this case the light name flare, a lens flare. And what you'll see is it's going to render the scene. And then it's going to compute the lens flare. And this is the standard default lens flare. This is what happens if you don't do anything else. Just leave it the way it is. So let's go back and adjust that. We'll hit Escape. And one other thing I'm going to do is I can see that my main light isn't really casting any light at all. It, intensity is 0%. Let me just adjust that to about 60. The lens flare light there is casting some light on the scene. So I'm not adjusting this main light to 100%. I'm just leaving it around 60. And let's render this. We're going to, now the fronts of the objects are lit as well. We have a lot of options for this lens flare, and let's go to the panel where you can adjust those. Just the lens flare options button, which is right underneath the lens flare button. We'll click on that, and these are our default options. This is the way the flare comes up if you don't adjust anything. So let's start by talking about intensity. Just the same way our light has intensity, our flare can have intensity. So if we set a 100% flare intensity, and we render this, what you're going to see is the flare is going to be much more pronounced. And what you're not going to see is you're not going to see the light, the amount of light that that light's changed, uh, uh, putting out actually change. 
the flare and the light intensity are completely different. In fact, you can have a zero intensity light with a 100% intensity flare or vice versa. There's a much brighter flare intensity and again, we can adjust the light and the flare intensity completely separately. Now, you can also envelope this flare intensity. You can adjust this over time, and that can be very useful. And we'll come back and do a couple special effects with that in just a little bit. Let's talk about the next option here. Next important option is these buttons here. Fade off screen, fade behind objects, or fade in fog. Now, what this means is, is the light, the lens flare visible in these three circumstances. If it's off screen, if it's behind an object, or if it's in fog. Now, we haven't talked about fog yet. We'll come to that later. Let's talk about one of the most important ones, I think, and that's fade behind objects. Now, let's just leave it in its default position, which is fade behind objects off. And let's take the flare, and we'll put it behind this table. Let's just go to a top view here to make sure it's behind the table, and it is. Create a keyframe, and now the flare is behind there. Well, what would you think would happen? Since the light is behind the table, we're not going to see the flare, right? Maybe. What's going to happen in this case is we're going to definitely see the flare. And you'll see that it goes right on top of the table. Now, this is not incredibly realistic, but the computer is doing what we told it to do. And there's reasons that you might want the flare to be in front of any objects if you just don't want to worry about position that much. You might want to have it that way. But in this case, again, it's not very, very realistic. What we want to do generally is turn on fade behind objects. That way, if you move the light behind an object, the flare will wink in and out, and it's much more realistic. And if you take a look at the animation that we ran at the beginning there and watch the flare, you notice as it pokes, it's moving in a diagonal line behind the word lighting there. And you'll notice as it moves behind the objects, in fact, it, in the intensity decreases and then increases it as it moves into space there. So again, it's a very, very realistic effect. And if we run it fast motion through, watch the light as it comes across. Very, very realistic lens flare effect there. Again, that's just the fade behind objects. Now, what fade off screen would do is if you turn fade off screen off, you'd always see the lens flare, whether the light was on screen or not. And fade in fog means if you move the light back into a fog bank, and you can set that from the effects menu, if you move that back into the fog bank, the light will disappear as it moves into the fog. Okay, the next options we want to look at here is flare dissolve. And what flare dissolve will do is it lets you, and I'm going to keep the 100% intensity here, but let me turn flare dissolve to 50%. And we have not turned on fade behind objects yet, so we'll just leave leave it where it is for right now. What you'll see is the flare is going to be just as big, but it's going to be sort of less bright. It's going to be sort of muted a little bit. And this is just with a 50% dissolve. Now, one reason you might want to use something like this is for an underwater effect, because a lens flare underwater obviously wouldn't be as bright as something above water. So that's one of the big uses for this. Okay, now our other lens flare options here are all on or off buttons. These are just things that you turn on or off, and these add different options. You might want to try experimenting with these, and we'll talk about a few of the options as we go on during this tape. One of the most popular ones is lens reflections. Let me change our flare dissolve back to 0%, so it's just 100% flare intensity, and turn on lens reflections. And let's just move the light object up and above this scene. And let's render this. Now what lens reflections does is it creates sun dogs, the interlens reflections that you get when a camera goes by a bright light. Now it's the kind of thing that cameramen spend hours and lots of time to try to avoid, and now you can do in the privacy of your own home with a computer. So you can create this lens flare, and as the light moves, the lens flare actually adjusts just as it would in reality. It's a very, very good, very realistic effect and it looks a little something like that. And again, as you animate that, as it moves across, it would change as well. One of the best ways to see the way these options work is to actually see all of them individually. And so let's go through a series of frames that I put together that show these individual options on or off. First one is central glow. 
And you see, this just puts the central glow, nothing else, just this light glow. Now, this glow, the color is affected by the color of the light. So in this graphic, I've changed the color of the light to green, and you can see that the central glow is changed to green. Red outer glow puts that red spot right around the outer glow, and that's not affected by color at all. This is central ring. Central ring puts that red ring right around the outside. There are two filters here, star filter. This one you can see pretty visibly. The next one, random streaks, is harder to see. It's very hard to make out just on its own. That's because the random streaks are very, very thin. This is just lens reflections. Now, there's two buttons here, anamorphic squeeze and anamorphic streaks. And what these do is these create lens flares that are similar to what you'd see if you're using a 35 millimeter SLR or IMAX camera, something like that. The difference in camera is that this type of camera produces a flattened out, widened lens flare. And you can see this is the way the anamorphic squeeze options look. This is the central glow, ring, and outer glow with the squeeze on. And this is the anamorphic streaks. And let me just show you here, there's two other frames. This is everything on. This is every option turned on, except anamorphic. And this is every option turned on with anamorphic. Again, okay, one other option we didn't show you there is glow behind objects. This is useful for putting a sort of ethereal glow behind things. It's very, very useful, again, for underwater stuff. One of the reasons this is in here is they needed this sort of effect for the TV show Sequest, which they rendered on video toasters. We'll turn on glow behind objects. Let's set our flare intensity to 200%, so it's very bright. And leave fade behind objects off here, otherwise the flare will disappear when it's behind another object. And now what we'll do is put the light behind our table here. And let's render this out. And you see what it's doing is it's putting the lens flare in, but it's going to be behind any objects. And one thing you want to make sure of is if you're doing a glow behind objects, that there's not an object behind the glow behind objects. Otherwise, it won't work. You need to have nothing basically but space behind any objects if you want glow behind to work. Okay, let's take a look at the way this glow behind here looks. And this is with the lens reflections and pretty much every option we could throw in there. And again, this makes this office scene a little more powerful, don't you think? That out of the way, let's go on to shadows. Now there are two types of shadows in Lightwave. There's ray trace shadows and there's shadow mapping. Now we're going to look at ray trace shadows first because they work the easiest. They work with any of the three light sources, distant point or spot. Let's just take a look at how this scene would render without shadows on at all. You're going to see it's going to take about 10 seconds for this to render. Now let's go and turn on ray trace shadows. Now there's two things you have to check before you turn on ray trace shadows. First off, your light source, whatever light you're using, has to have ray trace chosen. So let's look at our lights panel first. And under lights, where it says shadow type, for a distant or point light, we have two options, off or ray traced. Ray trace is on, so we'll go with that. And now we have to go to the camera menu, and we have to tell the camera to turn on tra shadows. So we'll click the trace shadows button, and it warns us that it may greatly increase rendering time. And let's hit F9. And if you watch the interface here, you'll notice that it's slower. Has it greatly increased the rendering time? Well, it doesn't seem to. But it's all a matter of perspective at this point. The last frame we did took 11 seconds to render. This one you'll see, and it's got shadows on it. You can see there are shadows everywhere. This one took 17 seconds to render. Now, six seconds difference doesn't seem like a heck of a lot. But here's the thing. Since the original image took 11 seconds, and this one took six seconds longer, that's over half the time that the original one took. In other words, this took about 50% longer. And ray trace shadows can add that much time. They can really slow the machine down. Now, there's a couple ways to cut the amount of time shadows take to render. And one of them is by changing your shadow options for objects. Each individual object in the scene has different shadow options. And we pick them from the objects menu. The three options are self shadow, cast shadow, and receive shadow. Now, these are pretty straightforward. Self shadow means that an object can cast a shadow onto itself.
good example of where you'd always want to turn this off if you're using a sphere. A round object, like a sphere or a ball, can never cast its own shadow. So you turn off self-shadowing. Cast and receive shadow just determine whether the object is capable of receiving shadows or casting them on other objects. And a good example of where you might want to change these options is let's say you've got a house on the ground. Well, the ground doesn't need to cast a shadow because it's the ground. What's it going to cast a shadow on? It's the ground. Now, on the other hand, the house might not need to receive a shadow. In other words, if there's no object bigger than the, the house there, you might be able to turn that off. Now, in our case here, we would probably want to leave our shadow options right where they are, it looks like. Uh, you might want to do something like turn off receive shadow because it doesn't look like these objects are really being affected that way. But, again, this is one of those things you have to sort of check on an object-by-object -object basis. The key is, if you can possibly turn one of these buttons off, you want to do it. It does speed up the render time. Okay, now one thing that we're not working with here, it makes it a little hard to see the shadows, is we don't have any ground object. And even though our grid here is showing, it's not really an object. And in fact, even if you were to go to the effects menu, turn solid backdrop off, so now we have these zenith, sky, ground, and nadir colors, like we talked about in tape one. What you'll see is it's going to render it, but it's not going to render shadows. It's not going to cast shadows onto those background colors. In order to cast shadows, you need it to cast onto an object. So we need to load up an actual floor object if we wanted the shadows to work properly here. Let's take a look at the way that looks. Again, no shadows on the ground. Sort of looks like it's on the ground, except there's no shadows there. So what we need to do is we need to load up a ground object. And what I did to create a floor for this scene is I just went into Modeler and dragged out a box, and I just made it very thin, and I made it about 4 meters on a side. So it's really about 12 feet across. And let me just load that up. And you'll notice if we go to the side view here that I've got the floor, so it's underneath the objects here. Let's go back to our camera view. And let's re-render this out. See, shadows look a little bit better if there's a floor for them to be cast on. The reason I didn't have that loaded there in the first place is this is a common mistake. People just assume that they see that ground plane that something's going to load onto it, and just not the way it works. So let's take a look at the way this looks. And it's going to take a bit longer to render because it's got that entire floor to render. And here's the way this looks rendered out. And again, remember we're in low resolution here. So some of the breakup in the image is just because we're in low res. Now this image took 30 seconds to render, and we can see that this is the way ray trace shadows work. It's pretty straightforward. You put the light, set it up, turn on ray trace shadows for that light. It defaults to on, by the way, so all lights normally will trace shadows. Then the important thing to do is to go to the camera menu, click on trace shadows, and instant shadows. Now the problem with this is that this takes a while much quicker way to do it is to use shadow mapping. And to show you the difference, we're going to show you this picture, and we're just going to render it out at medium resolution with low anti-aliasing set on. We're going to set the anti-aliasing threshold to 20, and just show you how long this image took with those settings with ray trace shadows. Okay, now here's the frame at medium resolution, and 4 minutes 35 seconds is the total time on it. And again, ray trace shadows, they look very nice. There's nothing wrong with ray trace shadows except 4 minutes 35 seconds, just the time it takes. That's why there's a new kind of shadows in Lightwave called shadow mapping. And shadow mapping has one big limitation. You can only use shadow mapping with a spotlight. So what we need to do is we need to take the light that we have in the scene currently, and let's go to the lights panel and turn it into a spotlight. And then we have a choice, shadow mapping, it opens up to us. And our shadow type, we'll click on shadow map. And we could go to our camera panel and even turn trace shadows off. It doesn't make any difference. What you need to do here, of course, is make sure that the light is hitting the whole scene. And the way I'm going to do that now is I'm going to open up my angle, bring it back to 30 degrees, and we'll put our soft edge angle to 30 degrees as well. And now let's just move our light back a little bit. We'll go to frame zero, move our light back. So it's hitting the entire floor and everything on it. Create a keyframe. And now let's create the shadow map shadows. The only difference here is you don't have to go to camera and click on anything. You just have to, in the lights panel, make sure you've got a spotlight selected, 
turn on shadow map, hit the render button, and away you go. Now again, we're going to show you this in medium resolution with low anti-aliasing so you can see the difference between these two images and decide for yourself. All right, you can see that this frame with shadow mapping took 3 minutes and 21 seconds. So you can see here we've saved over a minute of frame. And especially when you talk about animating, when you're doing 90 or 100 frames, or even more than that, it's a significant savings in time. It can save you two hours in rendering time, for instance, easily if your average frame time you're saving a minute. Now, the price that you pay here is quality. Ray trace shadows are perfect. On the other hand, shadows that are created using shadow mapping have a few problems, and you can see them in this frame. If you take a look, for instance, under the handles there, you see the edges are slightly ragged. Now, also, if you look right along the edge of underside of the desk, you'll also see the edges are a little ragged there, underneath the desk as well. And this sometimes looks like a soft or blurry edge shadow. In that case, it looks fine. On the other hand, sometimes it just looks a little weird. And you can change the quality of the shadow mapping and also the time it takes with a few adjustments here. So let's take a look at how we change our shadow mapping attributes here. First one to change is shadow map size. The bigger the shadow map size is, the more detail there'll be in your shadow map. Now the default is 512. If you use a lower setting, the shadow maps will be not as good looking, but they'll render a little bit quicker. Use a higher setting, around 1000 for instance, they'll be very, very good looking, but they'll take a long time to render, and sometimes they can take nearly as long as ray trace shadows. Generally, I leave the shadow mapping size about where it is, there's not much you can do on quality. There's some points where shadow mapping simply won't do. You'll have to ray trace shadows, but especially for flying logos or for a lot of images where you're just putting the image on top of a ground plane, it works fine. And one of the reasons for this quality is you have to understand the way shadow mapping works. To just to give a crude analogy, the way ray tracing works is it follows every beam of light in the scene. It actually sees where the light goes and then generates the shadows mathematically. What shadow mapping does is it's sort of a cheat. What it does is it looks at the scene and kind of creates a fake map of the shadows that it then maps onto the objects. So it's quicker, but again, it's a little more imperfect. Now, the other shadow mapping attributes are cone angle. And use cone angle will use whatever your current spotlight cone angle is. Now, you can change this so that the shadow map, if you want, turn off use cone angle. And you can give it a different angle. So for instance, the shadows will be at 50 degrees now. And that will make it look as though the spotlight were a 50 degree spotlight when it comes to the shadows, even though the spotlight itself is only, for instance, a 30 degree spotlight. And there's some cases where you'd want to use that again. It's not one of those things I change a lot. And the thing I use shadow mapping for generally is things like flying logos. And for flying logos, with all the special effects we've seen, to be honest with you, I generally just leave the lighting where it is. I generally don't mess around with the lighting too much. I'll sometimes add a lens flare, throw something like that in to give a little bit of visual interest. But aside from that, I tend to leave lighting where it is. So I don't adjust these shadow mapping things too much here. The only other one to be aware of is shadow fuzziness. And what shadow fuzziness affects is how fuzzy the edges of the shadow are. The lower the number, the more fuzzy it is. The higher the number, the more in focus the sharper the edges are. OK, so that's the difference between shadow mapping and ray trace shadows. You can combine ray trace shadows and shadow mapping within the same scene. So you can have a scene where you have five lights, let's say. Two of them are ray traced. Three of them are shadow mapping. The only thing you can't do is have one light that's both ray traced and shadow mapped. The enable lens flare and enable shadow map buttons, if these are turned off, it won't render any of the lens flares or your shadow maps. This means you can do a quick render without lens flare or shadow map to make sure the object position is right. Once you've seen that everything is OK and you want to re-render the entire scene, then just click those two buttons, and now your lens flares and your shadow maps are back on. This brings up another point about lighting. One thing is you want to be sparing when you're adding lights to your scene because every light you add to the scene can greatly increase the amount of time. OK, that's about it for lighting. Let's just finish up by taking one more look at this intro lighting animation and just talk about what's going on here. And we will cover everything that's gone on here. We've already talked about a number of these things. Let's start by loading up that scene. I'm just going to load the scene that you just saw up. And you can see that there's two objects here, a lighting object and a room object. Then we've got a number of lights here. In fact, we've got seven lights. You'll notice, again, I've given them distinct names. 
So there's main spotlight, flare light one, distant sparkler, and then colored spotlights one, two, and three. Now, one of the things that'll happen is if you look at this scene from just the camera view, and you do a make preview on it, I'll just do a bounding box make preview, you're not gonna see much going on unless you can see the lights. Because the only thing that's really changing here is the lights. So, let's go up and go to our options menu, show lights, so we'll see all the lights here. And now if we make a preview from our light view, you'll see a little more of what's going on there. Now this first light that you're seeing right here, that's the sparkler. That's where it's moving around and doing its sparkly thing. Here comes the, that's the spotlight there. This is the flare moving behind the object. These beams here are the three colored lights. And then you'll see this is the distant light changing its angle. And here comes the spotlight changing its angle. But again, because we're dealing with a complex lighting scene here, these simple motions are really only part of the story. A lot of the effects were done with envelopes. And you can see that if I just go to the light panel here, you'll see we have an envelope for intensity. We have an envelope for light intensity. And I'm just flipping through the lights here. Let me start with the main light. For the main spotlight, flare, the distant, sparkler, all of these lights have envelopes for their light intensity. Also, you can see I'm using at least one of every type of light here. There's a distant point and spot. Also, I've got shadow map shadows for a couple of different shadows. Those colored spotlights are doing shadow map shadows casting on the back wall. So is the sparkler. Uh, the sparkler is actually using ray trace shadows. Uh, the distant light is ray traced. And the flare light itself, I don't have it using any shadows at all. It's just a flare passing behind the object. And again, if you got into these things here, you'll see also that the main spotlight, I'm changing the spotlight cone angle, the soft edge angle. So there's really a lot of things going on here that are mostly in the envelopes. And some of the envelopes, again, are pretty complex. If I go up to the sparkler envelope that I used, this is the sparkler envelope here. This intensity envelope is half of the lens flare intensity envelope. So this is definitely much greater. And like I say, we're pretty much using every single light option in that scene. Now, the good news is that scene didn't take me very long to set up. I was able to set up that scene in less than a half hour. And it was just a matter of working in a very systematic way. And I didn't try to do everything at once. I didn't say, OK, I'll add 18 lights and then try to play with them. In fact, I added one light at a time. And then once I was happy with one element, I added a new light and went on from there. All right. Now let's start to talk about our camera work here and start to get into doing a few things that we can do with the camera. We've covered lighting, and as we talked about in tape one, one of the biggest things you can do to add visual interest to your scene is to move the camera around. All right, let's start by loading a scene that we've created already. And this scene just is a bunch of objects that come with the toaster. It's the Thunderbird object from the vehicles directory, the road and ground object from the landscape directory, also the trees object from there, the coconut tree, and Branch Line Station, which is your railroads directory. Branch Line Station's these little houses. And let's go to our perspective view here. And let's just take a look, real quick bounding box, how this looks. And again, you can see here's trees and houses, here's the road, the ground object, and we've got this car rolling down the road with its tires moving as well. Now, we have a number of different ways we can shoot this shot. The basic motion is set up, and now we really have a lot of options for what we can do with the camera. So let's start by just setting up a basic shot, where we just have the camera so we can see sort of everything. Maybe the car will come into view, and let's just go from there. And again, here it is from perspective view. But our camera starts, in this case, right in the middle. I've set it so the camera's reset to its middle position. Normally, of course, if you loaded these objects up, the camera would be starting offset somewhere. But let's just start it, and we'll pick the camera, go to the camera view, and we want to start at frame zero. And I'm moving, there's the car right there. Let's move up on the y-axis, kind of rotate our whole shot down a little bit. Let me move the camera down just a bit here. OK, and of course, to keep it in one place, we keyframe it. And now if we make the preview, here comes the car, and it keeps moving. 
Okay, now let's talk about a couple of the options that we have for the camera. One of them that creates, and this is all just keeping the camera in place, one of them that creates a pretty realistic shot is using the zoom controls. Now you can affect the zoom of the camera just like you could go from a wide shot to a telephoto shot on your camcorder at home. The difference here is that you usually don't do that. Usually if we want to zoom the camera in on something, we move the camera. And let's talk about zooming though, because it's something that's good to know for, for a few reasons. Here's the shot normal. This is the way it is normally. And let's just change our zoom factor on that camera. So we'll go up to our camera. And our zoom factor is listed right here. And it tells us that the equivalent lens is a 24 millimeter. Now this film size here, don't let this confuse you. If you click on film size, it brings up a lot of different options uh, so from Super 8 to an IMAX to <laughs> regular video cameras. And if you change these, you might assume, well, here, I'll set the IMAX and that'll look pretty impressive. What you'll find is, and the requester warns you, that this really only affects focal length when you're using depth of field and a couple of other things. But it does, it's not going to change the zoom factor, suddenly make your shot look like it was shot on film. So. Again, it's, it's handy when you start working with things like depth of field, but that's about it. Let's uh, just go back to normal 35 millimeter motion picture. And let's change our zoom factor to 4.64. And that will change us from a 24 to a 35 millimeter lens. And why did I know that 4.64 is 35 millimeters? Just because I remember it. I remember, I, it's one of those things that comes up kind of frequently, 35 millimeter lens is normal, so I've just memorized that setting. Normally what you do is you just kind of try things. 4.2, oh, that's 31. So just trial and error, really. Now you notice, as soon as we left here, the shot moved forward, it zoomed in a little closer on the shot. And what that means is, of course it means the object's gonna be a little different, our shot is focused in more, is also definitely gonna affect the perspective. Now, if we were to set our zoom factor, let me hit escape to stop this, to something, for instance, outrageously low, like a 0.5, this is going to widen up our shot considerably. And you see it also affects the perspective a great deal. You notice the car here is now just completely out of perspective. It looks more like a stretch limo than the T-Bird we've grown used to. And, of course, the same thing if you set it to something outrageously high, set it to 20. Now we're zoomed in, but it's also distorted. The road has changed perspective a lot. And I sometimes will set my zoom factor to 35 millimeters, to that 4.64, for just the reason we showed, for the perspective reason. If you're working with a logo and you find that the letters are fairly thick, one thing that might happen is, in the logo, let's say, in the last shot you want to be centered, sometimes the perspective will cause the logo to skew at the ends. So it's harder to read the letters at the end. They look too thick and they're hard to read. So I will set it to 35 millimeters, 4.64, and it works a little bit better. Now, you'll notice that there's an E next to our zoom factor button here. And of course, that means we can set an envelope. So let's just go back to normal here. And let's set an envelope. And of course, again, an envelope is just a way of animating values. So if we want it to start with a zoom factor of 4.64, and then 60 frames later, change to a zoom factor of, uh, let's say, 2.5. We'll just set two keyframes, one at 0 for 4.64, one at 60 for 2.45. Use the envelope. And now, again, the camera's not moving here. But you'll see, as the car moves into the distance, the camera's panning out a little bit, and again, it's it's zooming out. We're not moving the camera here at all. The camera's staying in the same place, and then it stops at frame 60. Now, you can combine this envelope, obviously, with a camera move. For instance, you could move the camera and zoom it at the same time. Let's just see how this move looks here. And again, this is just a zoom. Camera's staying in one place. And now let's combine them. It'd be pretty easy to combine them. Let's go to frame uh, 45. And let's say at frame 45, I want the camera moved up here a little bit and rotate it in. Create that as a key. Let's make this as a preview. Let's do a combination of the move and the zoom.
It's going to stop at frame 45. It's going to stop moving. But it's going to keep zooming, remember, till frame 60. Then it will stop. But the car keeps on going. Now, one of the things you'll find in trying to deal with the camera in Lightwave is just remember everything you know about video. And if this is basic cinematography. You can do almost any camera movie you've ever seen in a movie. So watch films, watch actual movies. I watch a lot of real motion pictures and try to see what the camera's doing. And one thing you'll notice that's very effective, and it's particularly effective in 3D, is get your camera moving a little bit. And as soon as we see this, I'll set up a shot where we just have a little bit of movement, and it makes a tremendous amount of difference. So here's the shot we just set up. One of the things you'll see here is it's banging into place, so it's a little bit of a jerky move. And this is one of those things you want to try to avoid. So why is it jerking around like this? Well, one thing is because at frame 45, it just bangs to a stop. And we can change that, of course, by using our spline control. So remember, a tension of 1 on that final keyframe will slow it down. So we're at frame 45. S for spline, or click on the spline control button. Tension of 1. OK. And we can also set a spline control on our zoom, by the way. If we go to our camera panel, go to the envelope, and go to this last keyframe, we can set a spline tension of 1 there. And let's do it on the first keyframe, too. This way, it's going to start slowly, pick up speed in the middle, and slow down again at the end. And just by changing the splines on both our camera move and zoom, let's see if this makes any difference. Now, one of the biggest reasons you want to have some camera movement in your scenes is because you're dealing with three-dimensional objects here, and by moving the camera, you really get to see that you're dealing in that you're working in 3D. You get to see more than one view of the object. And especially when you're working with things like reflection maps or shadows, just moving the camera, it seems like you're suddenly in a whole different world, which, in fact, you really are in 3D. So here is the move now with these blind controls, and let's see if that looks any better. Yeah, clearly a much better move. Now, again, it's probably, there's probably a little much going on for one shot, but at least it doesn't have that jerkiness. And that's one of the things I've seen. When I, when I watch people's demo reels, when I travel around the country doing seminars, a lot of people show me their demo reels. And one of the things I've noticed between the people who are really, really good and the people who understand the program and obviously know what they're doing, but their work isn't quite up to the work of the best people who work in Lightwave, is camera motions. I see lots of jerky camera moves. So the way to avoid that is just by using splines. And you can see here, even though the move isn't perfect, it's not got that jerky bang into place effect that we had before. OK, let's get rid of our motion path for the camera. We'll go to the motion graph. We had camera selected. Let's hit clear motion and then use motion. That will get rid of our current motion for the camera. Although you'll notice if we go back to camera here, that our envelope is still on. We still have a variable zoom lens. So what we need to do is let's just go back and uh, clear this completely. And we'll just set it to 4.64 at the beginning and continue from there. OK, now let's talk about another simple move. One thing you can do to make your camera moves more interesting is to keep an object in front of the camera. So have something, you know, have something that's moving by. And again, it's just standard sort of camera technique. And we have set up our scene here so that there's a bunch of objects in here. And you'll notice if I back the camera off that I have a bunch of objects on this side and just a couple over here. And the reason I did that is I put a couple of objects on one side of the road so I could position the camera on that side. And it would look like there's a lot going on. It would kind of fool you into thinking there's more going on than there actually is. So let's go to frame zero, since that's where we want to start our camera move. Move ourselves up. And just sort of behind the tree. I just want to rotate so we can see the uh, see the car just coming into view. Okay, so here's our zero keyframe. We're just in the car. Now let's go to our last keyframe here. It's 120 frame animation. So we'll go to frame 120. And at 120, the car is down this way, 
let's also give a little bit of a motion here so it drops down somewhat and let's see how this works now this is a very simple motion here at zero here at 120 and we'll probably get into trouble with this we're probably gonna lose the object at some point so far so good and then the car just moves out of camera range this usually happens when you try to set up a real simple two-frame move for the camera but again with the camera this rule is especially important you want to have as few keyframes as possible for your motion so here it's an okay move it's just we're losing the object at some point now one way we could avoid this is by moving to the middle frame see where we lose it so it's gone about here and then just kind of reset things so that the object is still in frame so we're just adding a keyframe in the middle here so now our keyframes are here at zero here at 75 and here at 120 and I just picked 75 because it was a frame in the middle where we had lost the object well, let's see how this works now you see we're starting to move the lose the object a little bit back here but that's okay and it looks like we keep it in frame for most of the rest of the shot now this is again this is okay this is more on track uh, let's do one other thing too and this is a standard thing I will do on camera motions it's just the first frame and the last frame give it that tension of one Now this will affect, this will definitely affect the way it tracks the object. In fact, we, we almost might, there's a pretty good chance we're going to lose it here quicker. Well, we're looking out here. But often when you change the spline tension, because it's speeding things up and slowing them down, you're going to find that you lose the object a little bit more. But this motion works okay. And one thing you'll find is that the camera parks very nicely at the end of the shot and starts moving kind of smoothly at the beginning of the shot. But you can see the problems we can get into just trying to keep the object in the middle of the frame. And that's why LightWave has a target function. Now, let's end playback here, clear the motion out. So our camera's motion is back to nothing. All right, and let's just move our camera over this way. And again, we're starting a nice high shot here. Let's park the camera here, create a keyframe at zero for it, and use target. Now what target does is it makes the camera track any object that you assign as the target object for the duration of the scene. You can also use targeting with lights, by the way. Now if we have the camera target this object, and in this case we want it to target the 64 Thunderbird body, what's going to happen is, you notice it automatically puts it right in the center. And we've only got one keyframe here. We've got the camera positioned off, away from everything, for one keyframe. And you'll notice that it is tracking the uh, car object perfectly. It's keeping it right in the center of frame there. Now, this sometimes works real well. And this shot here is probably a pretty good example of it works real well. We don't have to worry at all about losing the object. But there's one big problem with targeting, and there's a reason that most of the real good animators I know don't tend to use targeting that much, it's because it leads to very boring shots. The object always right in the center of the frame right there. So there's a trick that you can do to get around that, and that's by using a null object. Now, a null object, again, is a object, it's a single point, but it has no polygons attached to it. And it's just sort of a placeholder object. You never see it when it renders, so it's an invisible object. It's tremendously useful for a lot of things like this, though. So let's just load the null object. And the null object is outside of any drawer. Null object. Continue. And let's have the camera target the null object. Well, the null object is right, well, right there, right in the center. And if I go to objects, see the little dot right there? There's the null object. You notice I'm moving this guy around, and the camera's, the camera seems to be moving. Well, what's happening is I'm moving the null object, so the camera's tracking it.
Now, one thing we could do is have the null object parented to the car. Now, again, what parenting does is parenting takes whatever, takes two objects, basically, in this case, the null object in the car, and we're saying to the null object, follow the car. Wherever the car goes, you go. So, we're going to take the null object, parent it to the car, and again, parent it to 64 Thunderbird body. Now, let's go to camera. Again, we'll move the camera up here, and let's see what's happening. Now, this shot looks pretty much exactly like the shot we saw before. And that's because so far, this shot is exactly like the shot we saw before. There's no difference whatsoever yet. But here's what we can do. One of the problems with targeting is that targeting keeps the object right in the center. What we can do with a null object is offset the null object, either in front, behind, or to one side of the object. And by doing that, we can give the shot a little more headroom. So let's just change it here. We're going to go to object and we're going to take the null object and we're going to move it forward on the z-axis and we just have to create a keyframe for that null. And so what you'll see is as I move through the frames here that here's the null object right here. It's still parented to the car. It's still moving with the car. It's just in front of it now. And you'll see that our camera is still tracking that null object. Now, we can also, we can have the parented object. In other words, right now the child object is considered the null object. It can have its own motion path over the course of a scene. Right now, the null object is in front of the car for the entire shot. But if I go to frame 120 here and move the null object, uh, let's say, behind the car, maybe off in the x-axis a little bit. Keep that there at 120. Now what's going to happen is, again, as we move through the frames, here's the null object. Notice that this is always right in the center. This dot here is always right in the center. But it's still following the car because the null object is parented to the car. But since it has its own motion here, it's going a little bit off the track. And so this makes for a shot which has all the advantages of targeting, which are, boy, it's easy. It's real easy to target an object, get it set up, and get it moving. But it's got none of the disadvantages, which are this very boring, static, nothing shot. So this is a pretty good trick to use here. And again, you'll see this scene, let's take a look at the preview here, works pretty well. So you can use this sort of thing quite frequently. Let's talk about another use for parenting with a camera move here. And that's where we actually just parent the camera right to the car. So let's do that. Let's uh, pick the camera as our current object. Go to motion graph, clear the motion. So again, we're back to zero here. And now we're going to parent the camera to the Thunderbird body. And let's just make a quick preview here. What you're looking at here is really the car's eye view. You see right here, these are the wheels spinning in front of us. We're kind of in the ground right now, which would be painful, but that's okay. We're moving along, and this is not a great shot right here. But don't forget that a parented object can be offset. It can have a different position from the object that it's parented to. So the child can be in a different location than the parent. Normally, though, if you parent them, it just puts them right on top of each other. But again, that can be changed. So let's change that. And we're going to go to frame zero for the camera. We'll move it off. And let's move it uh, a little up so we're above the road. And maybe rotate it on its heading. So we've got the car in the shot here. And now we're behind the car going down the road. Let's create a keyframe to keep the camera in that position relative to the car and make a preview. Now, this type of shot where you parent the camera to the object can be very, very effective. And if we take a look at that preview here, you'll see we're rolling right along with the car. Now, again, one problem with this, it's, it's a good shot in a couple of ways, one of which is we get the scenery going by and the car going by. One reason it's kind of a boring shot is that we're just in one place relative to the car, but again, we can change that. So 
let's go to frame 120. And at frame 120, let's put the camera so it's over to the side and rotate it in. And I can see we're going to have to back it off and up maybe just a little bit. Let's rotate it on pitch. Okay, that works. Keyframe it. Now you'll see doing this, parenting the camera to the car, but moving the camera, giving the camera a couple keyframes on its own, has all the advantage of the parenting shot. But as you can see from the preview here, it's a much more interesting shot, much more of a sense of three-dimensionality here. Okay, let's set up a, another kind of shot now, and this is one, again, that's fairly normal, is a cut from one camera to another. And this is something people often wonder, well, there's only one camera in LightWave. What if I wanted to move from one camera to another? Well, there's two ways we could do that. One within the entire scene, and there's another one that I'll show you in a second here. Let me just give you one hint on setting up a scene like this. I will usually save my camera move for last. In other words, when I set up this scene originally, what I did was I loaded all the objects in, and I set up my world. I loaded the road up, got that set. Then I loaded a house, cloned it, put those in position. Then I loaded a tree, cloned it, put those in position. And once I'd set up the world, then I added the car, and then I set the choreography for the car. Started at one place, ended in another. Now that's my basic master shot. And I saved that scene. I did a save scene. Then I started working with the camera. So, again, that's important, and let's talk about how we could do a cut from camera to camera within this one shot. All right, so again, let's use our motion graph to clear the camera move here. It's just the quickest way to get rid of what you've done on the camera. And we're going to start the shot, uh, and again, this is one of those things where it, it helps to think about this first. Uh, our director of cinematography on this shot has told me what he wants is, he wants the camera to start above the town, long shot, then kind of boom down. Then we're going to cut to a shot as the car approaches the camera. So we'll cut to the, the shot from the camera low down, almost on the ground, and the car will zoom past. Okay, so let's set that shot up. First, we need to move the camera where we want it. Just reset our rotation. Move the camera up and back. We will rotate it over. and uh, move it in a little bit so at frame zero I don't want to see the car I want it to come into frame a little bit so we'll start it up here rotate it down a bit and there's keyframe at zero now at frame 45 well, let's do it let's do it at frame 60 we'll make it a two second shot at frame 60 we want the camera to have dropped down and Probably rotate it up a little bit. Something like that. There we are at frame 60. And on this first shot, starts here, goes down to here. I want to start slowly, pick up speed, then slow down again. Remember, that's just the tension of one on the first and last keyframe. And you'll see I do that same repetitive thing a lot. Well, that's because if you're doing good camera shots, you'll be doing that same repetitive thing a lot. So at 60, spline tension of one. At frame zero, S, one, then return a bunch of times. And let's just preview this so far. And we'll just preview frames one to 60 to see how this looks. Setting that first frame and last frame can be very, very helpful here because it means we don't have to watch the entire shot. The other thing you could do, of course, is just after frame 60, hit escape and do it. And if you hit escape at any point when it's making a preview, it will cut the preview off where you hit escape. So if we were to hit the escape key when it's rendering frame 65 in the wireframe preview, well, we'll have a 75 frame preview there that we can play. But let's just take a look at this first shot. Works OK. And now here's the trick. From frame 0 to 60, our camera is moving down. Well, at frame 61, and this is the only trick, we only have one camera here. So at frame 61, we need to put the camera in a completely different position. That's the trick. We don't have two cameras. We can't tell the camera to cut. So what we do is we take our one camera, move it one place at 60, another place at 61, and it's got no choice. Here at 60, 
here at 61, it will be there. So let's just go to frame 61. We will move our camera out here. And let's just rotate it around. And create a keyframe there at 61. Now, is this going to go past the camera by frame 120? Pretty good question. Yeah, it will. Unfortunately, it's, it's gone a little too far past. So one trick I might use here is I know I want the frame at 61, but let me just go to frame 120 and move our camera back to see where the car is. Okay, there's where it is. So now I'm moving the camera behind the car. And now I'm going to hit return to create a keyframe, but now I'll type in 61. So I'm at frame 120, and this way I can see the position I have to get into, but now I'm creating a keyframe not at 120, but at 61. And again, this is just a good sort of hack little trick to need to line things up properly. So let's create it at 61. There's no keyframe at 120 here. And let's just take a look at this whole move now. And we'll go last frame 120 now. And we can see the shot starting to come down. And like I say, at 61 it should cut in. Now one thing to remember here is the keyframes, there's only key, three keyframes for this camera move. There's 0, 60, then 61. At 61 it's just going to stay in the same place till the end of the scene. Because normally any object where you keyframe it, if you keyframe it here at 0, it's just going to, st and there's no other keyframes for it, it will stay at that last keyframe until the end of the scene. So again, at this point, it's just going to keep on there. Let's take a look at the preview. And looks pretty good. That might be one of those moves where, uh, one, one thing I'm noticing here, and that was once again suggested by the director of cinematography, is that the first shot here is probably a little too quick. Might want to hold on this shot a little longer. Well, there's a couple different ways we can do that. Let's just talk about one of them real quickly. And it's using shift frames. What I could do is, again, with my camera selected, go to the motion graph. And what I can do is I can just shift the keyframes. And I will shift all of the keyframes by, let's say, 20. And what that's going to do is, if I go through my keyframes now, keyframe at 0, keyframe at 80, then keyframe at 81. And it's just for the camera. It leaves everything else right where it is. Now, adding those 20 frames will make a difference because the shot does go by rather quickly, that first part. And by shifting the keyframes there, we can extend the length of that first shot and make the second shot take a little less time, which is probably, again, good. That second shot, to be as impactful as we want it to be, Making it fairly short where the car just zips by makes sense. That's a good use for shift frames. And again, we didn't shift frames for the whole scene, just for the camera. So let's take a look at that scene. Okay, that's the way the shot looks there. Call the Oscar committee. I think we're nominated. Now, this shot, again, fairly standard shot where you just cut between cameras. This works to do it in one scene because basically... Well, I'm not trying to do too much. If I wanted to cut to three or four different camera angles, there's another way I'd do it. Okay, I'm pretty happy with this scene, so let me just save this. And I'm going to save this with a different name. Uh, car going down the road, final, for instance. And let's take a look at the way this scene looks rendered. And this is rendered off of the DPS personal animation recorder. And this was rendered at medium resolution with low anti-aliasing. And again, also, by the way, the surfaces are not the normal surfaces that come with the objects. I can't stand the normal surfaces that come with these objects, so they're modified. But again, you can see how the camera move here adds a lot to the shot, particularly when you see the camera move by and you see the reflections on things like the windows of the houses change. Uh, it just adds a lot, tremendous amount to the way the shot looks.
Now, there's one other thing I could do if I wanted to do a more complex shot, three or four different camera moves, and that's this. I could take the original master shot. Now, you remember I talked about this before, where I would set up the whole scene, set up the car, set up the car, and just get the basic choreography set without even trying to do anything with the camera initially. Once I have that scene set, that 120 frames, if I wanted to split it up into three or four different camera moves, here's what I'd do. I would first start by just loading the normal scene. So, normal car going down the road scene. I'm going to change my first frame and last frame here. So let's say I wanted to do a initial shot which was uh, 45 frames from that high angle. Make my first frame 1, my last frame 45. And I'm going to go to camera, camera view. Just kind of move the camera up. And uh, out. So here's our initial shot. Hold the camera there. And so the first 45 frames are just this. Now let's say I want to cut to a low shot for the next 45 frames, a shot where we're parented to the camera. Well, one problem is I couldn't do this in one scene. And the reason why is because parenting is either on or off for the entire scene. So if I were to turn parenting on for frames 45 through 90, it would suddenly change frames 0 through 45. We don't want that. So let's just get this set up. Okay, there's 0 through 45. So what I would do is to set up the parent part, save this scene, this car going down the road, shot 1. Then reload car going down the road. Now remember, car going down the road contains the basic object choreography. And now I'm going to change my first frame and last frame. I'll make my first frame here 46 and my last frame 90. Now, select camera, camera view, parent to the body. Let's move this back. And uh, maybe up a little bit here. So now we've set up the second 45 frames. And again, we're doing something that we couldn't do normally, which is turn on parenting for part of the scene. Now we're going to save this scene. Let's take a look at that preview. Okay. Now we'll save this scene. As you guessed it, going down the road, shot two. Then reload up the normal scene. Just reload up the basic scene there. And now do the next 45 frames or 90 frames or however long we wanted to do. Now, once we were done with this, all we need to do is just make sure we saved out the frames. We'd render, basically we'd load up the individual scenes, render them out, and give them all the same frame store name. So, for instance, let me just set up the last frames here. And I'm going to set up a target on these last 90 frames. So from 91 through 120, We'll have the camera target the object here. And we will put the camera way down the road. OK, and let's make a preview those last 90 frames. Now, what we're going to do is, after this, you might have guessed what we're going to do. We're basically going to set this up as a shot called shot three, car going down the road, shot three. Here's the way these last 90 frames look. Now, with those three shots rendered, with those three sh scenes created, all we need to do is load up the first scene, render just the first 45 frames. But again, that's all. It's, since we set the first frame and last frame numbers differently, that's all it would naturally render. So we load up the first scene, it's going to render frames 1 through 45. And we will give those the same 
prefix as we would give the other shots. So for instance, after we'd saved this last scene, we'll save this as car going down the road shot three. Now if we're ready to render, load scene and we'd load shot one. Now one thing you couldn't do here is you couldn't save this as an animation. You couldn't save this using the save anim mode in Toaster 4000. The only way you can do this is to save the individual frames out. So we'll go to the record menu and we will do, since we're using the DPS personal animation recorder, we'll use the save RGB images mode and we click on save RGB images and then what we'd want to do is just find a empty space to put them in and I'm going to do it on uh, HD1 into the frame store directory here and we'll call this car. Then we would make sure our camera settings were where we wanted them. Medium res, low anti-aliasing, higher threshold, and I'll just turn soft filter on. Then we'd hit render and you'll notice it says frames 1 through 45. So we'd go through it and we'd render the first 45 frames. When that's done, we would load up shot two and just set everything up the same way as we did before including giving it exactly the same name when we went to record so in other words we would put the name car into the requester and this way it would the final version would have frames called car 1 through 45 then car 46 through 90 and the computer when it comes time to actually render those frames out to actually put them to videotape the computer just doesn't care. And here's the way this shot looks. And again, this is the three different sections. Now again, one problem with doing it this way, and again, problem is a uh, slight misnomer, is we couldn't preview this all at once. With the shot that we did before, we could see the different camera moves and preview them. With this way, you kind of have to use your mind a little bit more and picture the way the shots are going to flow together. Okay, finally, let's talk about a few of the other buttons on the camera requester. Now, the buttons right at the bottom of the requester, these buttons right here, field rendering, motion blur, depth of field, particle blur, then these settings which work with the other buttons. Let's start by talking about field rendering. Field rendering only works, and you can see it's not even an option until medium or uh, medium res, high res, or print res is selected. But since you really never want to use anything other than medium res, what turning on field rendering does is instead of the computer generating still fields where each picture has no motion in it, it basically generates 60 fields per second rather than 30 frames. And the difference is each frame will have some motion in it. Now, this doesn't look too good when you're looking at the still frame. When you're looking at animation, it makes a big, big difference. And the difference comes especially when you've got very large objects such as text and they're moving across the screen, for instance, left to right or something like that. If you tried to do a large text object and just get it moving left to right and you don't turn on field rendering, you're going to see the thing jittering quite a bit. Turn on field rendering, that motion is going to be smooth as glass. So that's what you'd want to use field rendering for. It doesn't really add much render time at all, if any, and uh, I typically leave field rendering on unless I'm going out to the animation mode here in the toaster. If you're going out to a single frame recorder or something like the personal animation recorder, then I would tend to turn field rendering on. It just makes the animations look that much smoother. Okay, here's an example of two scenes, one with field rendering and one without, and you can see the difference. You can see how jerky the non-field rendered scene is and how smooth the field rendered one is. Now, motion blur and particle blur are both related. Particle blur has to do with blurring single point polygons. And an example of single point polygons is the stars object. Motion blur turns on blurring for every object. And when you have an actual camera, a real camera, and you move it quickly by things, you'll see there's a little bit of blur on the motion. That's just a normal part of photography. This simulates that. Now to use this effect, you would turn on motion blur, and then you would set a blur length. Now, 50% is said to be the normal camera, what a, what a real camera uses for motion blur. I find that 50% tends to be way too much. So I'll typically set it to something like uh, 15 or 20%. Now, again, you'll notice you can turn on motion blur or particle blur separately, but blur length applies to both of them. 
You'll also notice that there's an E next to it, so you can envelope this setting, so you can change the blur length over the course of an animation. Now, a big important thing to know about motion blur or particle blur is you need to have anti-aliasing set to either medium or high resolution if you want to use these. And of course, by setting your anti-aliasing higher, the computer has to do a lot more passes, so it significantly slows things down. Motion blur can look very, very nice. And a good example of motion blur that you can see on your own toaster system, if you have a toaster 4000, is the effect where the clapboard comes in and clap, just the standard toaster effect. Watch that effect slowly. Just run it at the slowest speed or run it by hand using the T-bar. And you can see there's a lot of blur going on there. And it looks nice. But again, it slows down render time significantly. OK, now here's a scene using particle blur. And you can see the way these stars, as they spin around in the background, there's a tail behind them. This is without particle blur. And again, you can see the stars are just these little dots spinning around. Now, another thing that works and, again, looks very, very realistic, but that does slow down your render times quite a bit, is depth of field. The way depth of field works is it gives you variable focus. The focal distance determines how far from the camera will be in focus. And one trick here is, well, how far is the camera from this object now? It's very hard to see. So the way you can tell that is you go to the top view. And this grid here, I can see this grid is 20 meters. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the mouse to sort of determine how big 20 meters is. And I'm looking at the point of the mouse, where the top point is there, down to where the bottom of it is, nearly fills the square. So this is about 20 meters. Now let's just center our camera. Let's click right here. And so here's the object. That's about 20 meters, 40, 60. So my camera right now, remember, the camera sees from the center of the camera. Not from here, but from right here. So this is about 60 meters away. There's really not much more of an exact way to determine how far the camera is from any given object. You kind of eyeball it. If you wanted to get crazy about things, you could use little pieces of string and rulers or something like that. But th this is the way I do it. I just kind of eyeball it to figure out the focal distance. OK, and here's a scene where we're changing the focal distance with an envelope. And you can see how things are coming. The focus is actually changing in the scene as the focal distance changes. Now, in the other camera menu here, the other important thing that deals with depth of field is f-stop. Okay, now, the lower your lens f-stop, the narrower your depth of field, or the fewer things will be in focus. In other words, from your focal distance, that point will always be in focus. If you've got a fairly low f-stop, not much is going to be in focus except what's at that focal distance. If you have a fairly high f-stop, a lot of things are going to be in focus. You're not really going to see the depth of field too much. So if you want that depth of field effect to be pronounced, you want to keep a low f-stop. Now, one thing you'll notice about both focal distance and f-stop is, again, they're both envelopable. And that means that you can, by enveloping your focal distance, you could have a shot where the camera stays still, but things come in and out of focus. All right, that's all the time we have for this tape. Both of these topics, lighting and camera work, are things that I consider very essential. Lighting makes a big difference in the overall realism of the scene. And you'll find that by changing the lighting, you can not only create special effects by using envelopes and that sort of thing, but you can also make a scene look real. Now, camera work is very, very important for the reason that I mentioned before. Good camera work shows that you're working in a three-dimensional world and can make a big difference. What you want to go for in camera work, as in any of your object motions, is a nice, smooth motion path. Now, one other little hint here. One thing I would do if you want to really get good at either one of these is just try setting up a basic scene, some furniture or a town or anything you want, and then try experimenting with different lighting, styles and then try experimenting with different shots. One thing I'll do is I'll set up a scene, get some objects moving in it, and then try 14 or 15 different shots, a couple of dozen different shots in there. And you learn a lot just by trying different ways to shoot the same scene. As always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to write to us in the address you see on your screen now. Until next time, my name is Lee Strandian. Thanks a lot.